Hello, I'm Dr. Maria Solindra. Good evening, I'm specializing in integrative anti-aging medicine, practicing in Pasadena, California. Today, my guest speaker is Dr. Daryl Solindra, and uh, he specializes in physical medicine and rehab. Now, before I continue, I would like to also tell you that my background is also physical medicine and rehab, but Dr. Daryl Slindro is specializing, sub-specializing or doing in fellowship in interventional pain management. I would like to, before I start also, I would like to thank you for um, helping me and being a subscriber, helping me to get to 1000 subscriber. Now it's over 2000. And if you haven't done it, please subscribe, uh, do the like, and also share with your friends. Today, we, we would like to chat or discuss about the topic management of low back pain. Hi, Dr. Daryl Slindro. Hi, Dr. Maria. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, speak on your YouTube channel. Um, I'm really excited to discuss my expertise and my specialty to help educate people uh, about their low back pain and any future treatments and complications that may arise. Excellent, been waiting for this moment. And since we have a same last name, I'll just call you Dr. Darrell, okay? Now, let me introduce you the background of Dr. Darrell. Uh, he is a board certified in physical medicine and rehab like I said, he completed the fellowship training in interventional pain management from uh, UC uh, California, University of California in Irvine. Currently, he's practicing interventional pain management at BioHealth Pain Management in Londell, in Los Angeles. And um, Dr. Daryl's area of interest are regenerative medicine, which are probably similar, I also pursuing in that field, neuromodulation and minimally invasive spine intervention. So he's highly specialized in this topic today. The topic is management of low back pain. And uh, since this, uh, this is the area of Dr. Darrell's expertise, uh, we would like to hear from him now to how to manage low back pain in the next 30 minutes. And my first question, Dr. Darrell, is when is low back pain becomes dangerous for our health? Can you share that with us? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, for, in most cases, low back pain is still a mystery for a lot of us. You know, low back pain is one of the most common causes of missing work. One, of the most common causes for a patient to see one of their doctors. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, even with all the treatments that we have, a lot of the general kind of back pain that we have, what we call mechanical low back pain, it's still like a lot of people, we still don't really know uh, what's going on. However, the issue with low back pain in general is not the back pain itself. Uh, chronic pain, pain that persists and lasts can cause uh, long lasting issues in your health. It can uh, cause you to have early mortality. It can cause early dementia. It can lower your immunity. It can lower your health. It can cause increase in rates of cancer. But really what we do not want to miss in low back pain are, um, is, is the low back pain a result or a symptom of something that's a lot more dangerous, right? So for example, in a patient who has a history of some sort of cancer, maybe prostate cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer, you know, if they start developing low back pain, oftentimes, you know, patients, even myself will be like, oh, it's just back pain. That's normal. It'll go away. But oftentimes you want to make sure that this back pain is not something of another medical condition. Maybe the cancer could have spread to the lumbar vertebra or the bones in the spine. And in that case, just brushing it off and delaying treatment would be a detriment to your health. 
because early capture of this could cause uh, improvement in outcome and mortality. Another thing that you know, we wanna be careful of is do you have an infection of your spine? A lot of times, especially if we're older, you know, I've seen many cases where patients get a little scratch and they kind of brush it off and then they start having back pain, but with the back pain comes kind of like fevers, chills, and it turns out that this little cut transmitted an infection from the environment and somehow it wound up in the bloodstream and it's seated or it parked in the spine area. So, and then it gave them kind of like an epidural abscess or, or a collection of bacteria in their spine. So these are the things that you wanna be careful of as you know, cancer infection. Other things that we want to be careful of are again, medical conditions, patients with autoimmune disorders. You know, there are plenty of young women and men that have back pain and they just kind of deal with it throughout their lives. They just kind of deal with their back pain. They do therapy and exercise, but they still have back pain. And later on in life, they find that all along they had a condition called ankylosing spondylitis. It's an autoimmune condition that affects their spine and their back, which could be very well treated with the appropriate autoimmune medications by rheumatologists. So these are kind of like the non-specific kind of back pain conditions that are medical conditions that may be dangerous. Back pain itself, you know, it can be caused mechanical or just generalized back pain, but certain back pain conditions may be dangerous in the sense that it causes long-term problems. So back pain caused by a disc herniation, or if you get aged and older, uh, degeneration of your spine causes spinal stenosis or pinching of the nerves in your spine, inherently may cause a lot of pain. And the pain itself you know, can be managed, but sometimes it also causes things like weakness, changes in your bowel and bladder control. It can cause sensory changes. And those are things that are red flags or things you wanna monitor because sometimes if you start having the, the motor or the strength weaknesses and you let it go for too long, you know, oftentimes that can lead to permanent weakness if not caught early to have some surgical management for it. So in most cases, low back pain is not dangerous, but you wanna pay attention to the other symptoms that come with this back pain, including uh, sensory changes, motor weaknesses, if you have any fevers, if you start tripping and falling a lot, and all of these things are important. My goodness, excellent. So everyone, you know how um, just a little work like back pain cause a lot of, um, you know, interaction, intermingling with all kinds of diagnosis, including dementia. So I just wonder why people can cannot sleep because of the back pain and they continue with their uh, activities without even seeking help, uh, looking for uh, another uh, opinion from a doctor. Now, uh, before we continue, I would like to make sure that you understand that although we are dealing with the spine, with bone, muscle, joint, we are not orthopedic surgeon. We are physiatrists, which is specialized in physical medicine. So, um, this was uh, this is a new field in Indonesia. I'm pretty sure it's probably like uh, 20 years, but here is almost like 75 years or or so. So people here, when they have back pain, they are quite nervous uh, to see a orthopedic surgeon because they think it's always surgery. And today you will, you will hear from uh, Dr. Daryl that low back pain doesn't mean uh, anything. Um, but evaluation and make a, a correct diagnosis so we can do a management or treatment that is appropriate and avoiding the surgery if unnecessary. Now, Dr. Darrell, since we cannot see the pain, we can only feel it. Many of us is wondering what caused it. And the first reaction is get an x-ray, get an x-ray. But some of, uh, some of, uh, some people now realize that there are many diagnostic tools like CAT scan, but MRI is more popular now because uh, this does not give us any radiation. Do, do we need an MRI for um, low back pain? 
Yeah, Dr. Maria, I think you nailed it exactly on the head. I think the most important thing for low back pain is getting the correct diagnosis. There are many things that can cause this low back pain. Now, you know, as a mentor once told me, if you had 10 minutes to talk to a patient, nine minutes should be spent on the history and the physical, and then only one minute on reviewing the MRI imaging. The most important thing to diagnosing low back pain is the history. How did the patient get this back pain? Does it go down their legs? Where in the back is it? Is it worse with sitting? Is it worse with standing? Is it worse with bending over? Is it worse with leaning back? A lot of times with just a, a good solid history and physical, basically um, the, the, the doctor listening to the patient, which is very difficult now in medicine where you know, they, they, they're trying to get us to see patients every 15 minutes, you know, it's like a, like a machine, it's very difficult. So I'm sure your patients must appreciate that you get to spend a lot of time with them. A good history is the most important. Interestingly, you know, the MRI images or the picture of your spine doesn't always correlate to what's causing your pain. Many people who have bulging discs, herniated discs, arthritis in their spine, there are many people out there in the world that are walking around with spines that can, you know, you can definitely say it's a pathologic or a diseased spine and they have zero pain at all. So really the most important thing is the history and the physical. And then if you, if, if then at, there are some red flags or there are some things that, for example, uh, I usually get an MRI in a patient that has back pain, especially if they have pain going down their leg because the MRI will help kind of tell us if there is a disc that has herniated or impinged on the nerve root. And the MRI is a valuable tool in order for us to pinpoint the location of injury so we can treat it. But I would say that not every patient needs an MRI and definitely you shouldn't base the treatment of your low back pain on the MRI. The treatment of the low back pain should be spent on the history, listening to the patient, which is the most important and then the physical exam that comes with it. Thank you. So it's very clear that uh, we are considered like lucky if we have the pain because that is the symptoms. And Dr. Darrell had already mentioned it, some low back situation do not come with any symptoms or pain now. So um, to catch it early, if you're lucky the pain is actually our navigation to find what the cause of it, right, Dr. Darrell? Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, it's, it's, it's always better, especially if you're a little older and you have a little bit of a degenerative condition. Pain as a symptom, you know, just pain is much, much more preferable than pain and weakness because oftentimes the pain can be helped with uh, aggressive physical therapy, weight loss, an anti-inflammatory diet and some simple medications, as well as some, you know, based on my training, I would say simple injections and interventions. However, once you start developing that weakness, not only may the weakness can be coming from the compression in your spine itself, but you know, we go through something called deconditioning. Once you're not used to doing something, you know, as they say, if you if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So once you become deconditioned, it's very difficult to kind of get that back as well. So if it's just pain as a presenting symptom, I think that should be evaluated and addressed as soon as possible. Thank you. So as, as I mentioned earlier, don't be afraid because 90% of the case of low back pain is usually non-surgical. That's according to the uh, report. 90% is non-surgical. So you, and now you have the luxury to find these doctors, right? We are called physiatrists, physical medicine and rehab. Now we are trained to uh, not only looking at low back pain, but today we only talk about low back pain. Now, however, uh, we have to be very objective. If there is an indication for surgery, we are trained to identify that, don't worry, okay? So when is back surgery? an option for my low back pain? Yeah, back, back, you know, our back surgeons that we work with, we highly respect them and they're great physicians. And most surgeons, uh, especially the spine surgeons, they don't, they don't want to operate if they don't have to. Because, you know, a surgery is an irreversible procedure. So, you know, there are some clear 
kind of indications for, for getting a back surgery. If you have sudden loss of strength, sudden weakness, sudden loss of bowel and bladder, and then they do an imaging and you have this kind of disruptor that's compressing your nerve and it's squishing the nerves in your spine, that is definitely an indication of surgery because if you don't uh, kind of stabilize the spine and open up that space, you may have irreversible neurologic damage. You may have irreversible loss of walking, irreversible weakness, irreversible control of your bowel and bladder. Other cases of, you know, where surgery is indicated is if you have any spine instability, right? As we age, maybe with, you know, a trauma, you can have instability of your spine as when, when you bend forward or backward, your, your kind of vertebra, you slip over each other. And if that, you have an instable spine, that's definitely an indication for surgery. You know, other, other indications like the cancer indication and stuff, that's like more rare, but those are mostly of the indications of spine surgery. Finally, uh, spine surgery is definitely an indication if you followed kind of the steps of treatment. You had a good, strong physical therapy program. You're on a conservative, you know, relatively uh, conservative multimodal or multi-medication uh, management of pain. And you've probably tried some interventions. That's an indication for surgery itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, since since we, we are all trained to do minimal, um, as minimal as possible, um, intervention or invasion pro, uh, uh, treatment, such as, um, for example, we do block injection or prolo therapies. You know, I was trained a long time ago, like 35 years ago. So you have more varieties of um, interventional uh, management of this. Uh, now, so as simple as uh, I can think, okay, if I get an injection like epidural or injection to reduce the inflammation somewhere, do I have to keep getting them? Maybe people are afraid that they have to keep getting them until when, okay? When do you know that we need to stop? Would you like to share with us? Yeah, it's, it's a very exciting time to be in this kind of like interventional pain management, minimally invasive spine world. I mean, not, not only have, are the surgeons uh, getting the availability to do smaller and smaller procedures, you know, they're doing these really small endoscopic microdiscectomies and stuff like that, but also in terms of the, the pain world, we're getting to do a lot of these uh, minimally invasive procedures. So we get to do, you know, minimally invasive, you know, lumbar spacers right now. We can remove ligaments just through, uh, you know, maybe a one centimeter incision in your spine, we can put multiple devices in your spine, all through just the use of like an x-ray guidance, fluoroscopic guidance, and a small incision. But in terms of getting these injections, if, if your physician um, has deemed you a candidate to get an injection, it's really because you yourself as a patient feels that your pain is bothersome enough to your, your quality of life, your day-to-day -day activities, and your activities of daily living, your pain is strong enough that, you know, physical therapy hasn't helped and it's time for you to try this injection. The injections that you get do not make your spine worse. The spine that you have, the more fault, the, the structures that you have are not really affected with these injections that you have. How often do you have to get them really depends on patient to patient. Some patients may only need one injection and they're good for six months to a year to forever. Some patients may get an injection and the pain relief may only last one to two to three weeks. So really there's a big debate right now how many injections you should try before you stop getting these injections. Definitely if you get an injection, one injection and you have no pain afterwards, you shouldn't get another injection until your pain comes back. There's no data to support to get an injection to prevent or, you know, just in case the pain comes back. No, I mean, yeah. you should get the injection and then you just wait. The other thing is, let's say you get an injection and the pain comes back within a couple of weeks. Would it be reasonable to try one more injection? In my opinion, I think, yes, it would be reasonable to try. But if really the pain relief doesn't last, you know, around three months, four months, two and a half months, then I think it's, it's warranted at that point to 
try to move ahead and find other interventions to do. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So um, that is what uh, I think happening because people, many people are afraid that the injection will be given too many times. And since we also use um, medication like steroid and, you know, how some people think that steroid is really bad for your health. And we actually inject it in locally to reduce the inflammation. So we, I'm glad that you explain about, you know, injection, if it works, then the dosage itself also uh, is enough, then the pain will go away if it caused by just an inflammation. And then you don't need to inject some more. However, some people think then the back pain is just an ordinary old age back pain, you know, and then, and it is very, af they are afraid to see a doctor and they think that it is not important as it will not be serious enough to their health. And you had mentioned about uh, what is the risk and also what happened, uh, what is the differential diagnosis for low back pain. I want people to know the real risk and what to think of it, Dr. Darrow. You want to share with us the risk? Yeah. So especially with, you know, just chronic run-of-the-mill uh, age-related low back pain, the number one thing that, you know, comes to my mind is, you know, how much low back pain impacts the quality of life. You know, you spent, most people spend 30, 35 to 40 years of their life grinding away and working. And when they finally retire, they want to enjoy their life. They want to maybe travel. They want to spend time with their kids. Maybe they enjoy gardening. Maybe they enjoy walking around. And a lot of times, you know, patients with low back pain, this really limits or severely limits the, what they, the ability that they can do these things. So quality of life is really one part of the factor that, you know, is very important for, for a first world. And, you know, even I think in most parts of the country, the world. A first world country, really, the focus of what of a thing that I like to do is really what is the quality of life of the patient and how much are they enjoying their life? And is their back pain stopping them from the things they want to do? Now, of course, we have to set realistic goals, right? If you've never run a marathon in your life, and now you have back pain, just because I help your back pain doesn't mean you're going to run a marathon. But really, uh, goals such as being able to uh, stand up and you know attend your, your granddaughter's birthday or being able to go on a trip with your family. Maybe you like to go hiking with your family. Those are things that can really be helped. And it shouldn't just be like, oh, it's just back pain. You know, it's just, this is too bad. I'm just gonna deal with it and not be able to enjoy my life. The other thing is, let's not forget, I mean, patients or not even just patients, doctors too, our activity levels over time have dramatically dropped, right? I mean, physical labor is not really a thing that we do now in the United States. You go back 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, uh, the, the, the physical labor of our workforce is much, much higher. So if you're not moving around a lot because of your back pain, that increases a whole, you know, decreases your exercise tolerance, you don't exercise, that increases a whole litany of kind of medical complications cardiovascular health, which is the number one cause of death in this country, you know, that, that goes down. Dementia goes up because the blood flow to your brain doesn't reach, reach there. Sexual health goes down. Depression goes up. So overall, you know, this decrease in activity leads to a whole host of other medical problems that if, if back pain is stopping you from exercising and living a full life, you know, I think that should be addressed. Thank you. So, um, you know, we have a couple questions, which I think at this point, we, we should answer it first. One of them is, um, since you already talk about the risk and all those, uh, can you mention about this abdominal aneurysm that caused low back pain and kidney stone as a cause of low back pain? Uh, how do you, when you diagnose that, uh, do you manage it in, in your office or want to handle this yeah. question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, abdominal aortic aneurysm is, is, is scary, right? Because a rupture, you know, is a very, very high mortality rate. So an abdominal aortic aneurysm, I, for both diseases, the kidneys too, abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, should be managed by uh, abdominal or vascular surgeon. 
they're the specialist in this. If the aneurysm is big enough, maybe they can do an interventional uh, kind of sheath to protect the aneurysm or cut the aneurysm off, or they can do an open surgery. I generally don't manage patients with abdominal aneurysm pain because it's not really the pain that we're worried of. It's really, if that ruptures, it's a life or death situation. So right. if a patient comes to us and we, you know, we uh, luckily I haven't had to deal with this, but if we find uh, an aneurysm, that patient has to see an abdominal surgeon as soon as possible. Now, kidney stones are another thing. Like kidney stones, the pain caused by a kidney stone, right? is caused by the kidney stone itself. Mm -hmm. So the treatment for that, you know, the treatment for that is removing the kidney stone. So whether the urologist will do it through a laser or a lithotripsy or a surgical procedure, you know, I, I hand it off to the urologist. Now that doesn't mean I haven't had patients with chronic kidney stones that I manage. I do manage them, you know, these, this is one of the very rare indications that I do use low doses of medic different types of medications to help with this pain. But at the end of the day, you need to treat, you know, pain in general, you need to treat the pain generator. What is causing the pain? You just want, you don't want to just take a bunch of medications just to cover the pain up. Exactly. Thank you. So pain is annoying, very annoying. People can be depressed because of pain. The pain medication can give them some comfort and relief. But like you said, you don't want to treat uh, the um, patient with the medication all life. So, but some um, opioid and, you know, make them have a good night's sleep. This is a class uh, schedule drugs naturally found in the opium poppy plant. And that works in the brain to produce a variety of effect including of course, the relief of pain. What is the role of opioid medication in low back pain? Yeah, so the role of opioid medication in low back pain nowadays is relatively limited. Um, you know, there is a role of opioids in cancer pain. Uh, there is a role of opioids in post-surgical or after surgery pain. And there is some role of narcotic medications for acute pain that is going to be addressed in other measures. Um, for most cases of general musculoskeletal pain, so pain caused by disc degeneration, pain caused by arthritis, pain caused by a pinched nerve, there's actually very limited evidence that opioid medication does anything good for it in the long term. In the long run, you know, the effects of narcotics or opioid medications are, are great. It increases mortality. It is the anti of anti-aging, right? It cuts your telomeres and makes you die faster. It makes your body age, makes your DNA age faster. It, right. it dramatically uh, destroys your testosterone. So if the, the, the mainstay and foundation of, of back, you know, back pain therapy is physical therapy and having a strong core and strengthening your spine, the loss of testosterone in both men and women, you know, are dramatically de decreased in patients who take opioids for the long term. It increases their dementia rate. Uh, paradoxically, taking chronic opioids in itself may lead to a condition called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, meaning the longer you take them, the more your pain receptors are more sensitive to pain. So you start having even worse pain all, all over. So overall, I think the management of uh, low back pain nowadays, uh, we've kind of shifted away from using narcotic management and we've gone into a more holistic approach, which includes nutrition, um, physical therapy, uh, strengthening mental health, as well as these interventional procedures and surgeries that we have nowadays. Yes, agree with you. Uh, since you mentioned about physical therapy, there's one question that is appropriate to uh, answer at this time. Um, Victor asks, do you use the DRX 9000 machine for low back pain? Do you know what DRX 9000 is? I have seen uh, one. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what a DRX 9000 machine is. That, that's that's a, a machine that will pull intervertebra, you know, slowly and uh, you do it like, um, you know, maybe 25 times or 40 times to release the compression. It's just the decompression. Oh, you right. 
I think they want to ask if you have that machine there. Oh, oh, oh no, I, I don't have that machine. Um, so it's 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 basically a type of traction machine. Is that correct, Dr. Maria? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, you know, in, in terms of the studies that I've read and what I recommend to patients, I mean, the, the traction therapy that happens during physical therapy uh, for the lumbar or low back, um, the data is actually a little bit weak for it. They, they haven't shown that it uh, helps more than regular physical therapy in the long term. Uh, there is better data for the neck, you know, and help, helping with neck pain and uh, shooting pains for the neck. Uh, but again, I, I didn't delve into these studies to see like the, the traction protocols. I don't know what kind of machines they use. So honestly, uh, at this point, I don't know uh, if, if yeah. th that specific machine will help. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, since we already talked about um, the opioid, so how about like therapy like heat? Heat helps to improve circulation and relax the muscle. Could help, uh, could help to block the pain. What should I do if I pull my back, let's say? Should I use heat or ice to help? Yeah, this is a question that we get many, many times for our patients. They always ask, oh, is heat better for my back? Is ice better for your back? For me, I mean, the heat serves a, a couple purposes. It helps with improving the circulation that leads to the area. It helps kind of vasodilate everything. It helps relax the muscles. You know, it helps kind of progress your healing. For me, most people who kind of, when they say, oh, I pulled my back, usually it's like a muscular strain or it's a mechanical low back pain. I think heat for that issue serves its purpose much better. However, you know, cold itself does want like a lot of wonders for a lot of my patients, especially th those with pain that's more nerve related. Really the cold, uh, it's really just for its an analgesia effect to just kind of help kind of deaden the pain receptors in the area. You know, both heat and cold, they both will help stimulate and release a little bit of the own body's kind of endogenous or own body's um, opioid endorphin receptors, something like a runner's high. So my, my experience for uh, giving advice to my patients is to try both. Uh, I prefer heat, but try both and see which one helps you more. Yeah, I prefer heat. I even drink hot water. So all my life, when when winter comes, the heat suits um, my muscles. And some patients do both, like, uh, you know, uh, intermittent heat and cold pack that, and helps. You're right. Yeah, it depends what actually helps them. Some people are prone to develop this low back pain, right, Dr. Darrell? Are there some risk factors for developing low back pain? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the, the biggest risk factor for developing low back pain is genetics. Uh, if you look at your family members, uh, especially the older members, if they have a degenerative spine condition, if they have uh, back and leg pain, you know, the genetics is, I think, one of the strongest indicators to see if you'll develop low back pain in the future. Uh, but there are other things that have shown to have higher rates of developing low back pain. Uh, among them, almost number one is smoking. Um, smoking, incidents of smoking, most smokers, uh, a lot of them develop back pain and, and, and uh, indeed most smokers have chronic pain in general because smoking is such an inflammatory process that it causes the, this cascade and worsening of inflammation in the body. Other things that have been linked to low back pain include a poor diet, uh, high BMI or body mass index, so patients who are heavier and more overweight. Uh, patients who have kind of scoliosis and, and also have in, in increased chances of having low back pain. And inactivity or patients who are not as active have been shown to develop more low back pain in the future. Um, other things that may develop are any early injuries. So for example, if you had a pretty bad car accident when you're a little bit younger, that may progress into having a higher risk of having low back pain in the future. Oh, thank you. So everyone, you, you heard what he said, okay? So you have to keep moving and do some exercise, not just sitting. Now, before we close, because it's, we reached 30 minutes, and I would like to answer some of this question, if you don't mind, Dr. Darrell. Yeah, sure. Okay. 
So, uh, Heather asks, I have a chronic pain from above my tailbone down to the ankle. Can my low back pain cause the ankle pain? Definitely, the low back pain may cause ankle pain in a variety of reasons. You know, I can't comment on your specific spine in general, but oftentimes when the, the disc in your spine or if there's a little bit of inflammation and it impinges on a nerve root, the nerve root is causing sensation for what we call a dermatome. So it's kind of like a pattern of pain. So oftentimes, for example, if people have you know, most commonly an L5 dermatome. So patients may have pain that goes from their back, goes down their buttocks. Oftentimes it goes down the outside of their leg and it goes down to their ankle. If you have an L4 nerve root, it may instead go down the front of your leg and go on the inside of your foot to the middle ankle. So really it can cause back pain, what we call lumbar radiculopathy, uh, Normal people may call it sciatica. They say it's my sciatic nerve. Really, most of the time, it's not the sciatic nerve. That can definitely cause pain radiating down the leg to the ankle. Thank you. What, what Dr. Darrell said that it's a, the radiating pain, that's the neuroradiculopathy. We try not to use the terminology, but when it does, I would like to explain. I'm sorry, Dr. Jero. So they, they might say, what's that? Okay, That's a radiating pain. Then we call it a radiculopathy, okay? Now, another one, um, do you take care of neck pain? They want to know if you can discuss a little bit of neck pain. Yeah, yeah, I, I take care of most. Pain. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I take care of most, most pains in general. Um, actually, I think, you know, in the future, I, I may come back and we'll discuss different pains, including joint pains, neck pains, headaches. So yeah, I, I, I take care of almost all type of pains in general. We will cover that, okay? We'll cover that. I've been waiting for your schedule. You are so busy and I'm so glad I can catch you now today. <laughs> so um, this, the other one is, Victor asked, my former cardiologist used the upside down machine to relieve his pain or as a preventive due to use of the heavy lead jacket. So basically his doctor wear the heavy lead jacket during the procedure, maybe interventional cardiologist. And so he has back pain. So he just do the uh, tilt table. I do that every day, five minutes. Yeah, I think, the, I think you should do uh, whatever helps your pain. I think conservative measures help a lot. You know, if this tilt table really helps you conservatively, and it can, uh, you can not take medication, it improves your quality of life. I don't see any harm in trying it. I don't see any harm in trying a lot of conservative manage management, you know, changing to a more plant-based diet, acupuncture, cupping, e-stem, all these stuff is very, very low risk. And it really, you just have to try to see if it helps you. Correct, yes. Uh huh. Now, um, a little bit of this, how does cannabis help with pain relief. Do you use cannabis also? Uh, I personally do not use cannabis. Uh, I have my own views on cannabis. I think we're vastly underreporting the dangers of it, including, you know, there are reports of decreasing blood flow to the bl blood flow to the brain, possibly increasing dementia and in heavy cannabis users. Personally, I've seen a lot of effects in my patients uh, during my procedures. They're a little bit more twitchy when I try to do the injections under sedation, it's much harder to get them under sedation. During surgeries, they have greater blood loss. So I think in general, the, the, the public media were, were kind of downplaying the, the long-term risks that you, this kind of public acceptance of using cannabis uh, is. Um, there is some mild to moderate data of the evidence of using cannabis to help pain but most of the data is mostly on nerve pain. It shows to have some effect to help with nerve pain. You know, I do have patients who use cannabis for their low back pain. And if that can, you know, if we can, if they're, you know, I talk to them about the risk that I know of, but if it helps their pain, I'm, you know, it's okay for them to take it. Um, but in general, I don't prescribe any cannabis for low back pain. Okay, thank you. Uh, last one. We, we will discuss this uh, back, we, we will discuss uh, pain in general with osteoporosis. But the question is, 
Dr. Cindy Wansuno, can you uh, discuss a little bit about osteoporosis and low back pain? Yeah, I osteo. Sorry, um, osteoporosis is you know a disease that that affects millions of people in the United States, mostly women. You know, one out of third, one third of uh, you know. I think this might be old data, but they use Caucasian women after the age of 65 have some sort of osteoporosis that, you know, in their body. And that's osteoporosis basically kind of like the mineral density or how, how dense and the formation of your bones. It's like less, less dense. They're like, you're more prone to fractures, you're more prone to falls. So I think in general, osteoporosis is a disease that affects patients. These patients often do have low back pain. Um, they may have osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures, which is the bones in your spine, they kind of get crushed like a pancake, they lose their height, and that can cause a lot of back pain in general. So again, in general, patients should try to be as active as possible. They should work on building their muscle health, muscle tone, and weight bearing, load bearing exercises have been shown to help prevent and delay and help patients with osteoporosis. Oh, thank you so much. Now, before I close, I would like you to give us a short take home message. Yeah, uh, thank you again for inviting me on your show. Um, overall, I think low back pain is a condition that affects many of us. Um, I don't think you should be afraid or just kind of brush it off before you seek medical attention. A lot of us really just need maybe a little tweaking in our physical activity regimen. Um, overall, I encourage you all to maintain or lose weight improve your diet, increase your physical activity. And uh, based on what I see in my practice, please don't get into a car accident. Oh, yes, of course. That's what happened to me, I guess. Okay, so Dr. Daryl, thank you so much for spending time with us on this topic of managing low back pain. I hope everyone knows uh, where uh, he is practicing in. Uh, again, can you tell, tell us where is that? Oh, yes, I, I practice in Lawndale, California. It's on the west side of LA, in between South Bay and, and Los Angeles. Yes, yes, okay. Now, uh, the difference between a pain management train when I was trained and now, uh, plenty. Because with the new technology, with new equipment, and with new theory, and with the robotic in, uh, invention uh, surgery, the interventional um, pain management become very fast in advance. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I didn't even ask you if you want to share any um, slides. Are you trying to share any slides? Uh, oh, no. I, no. I have some, but if... if... You don't have to. It's okay. I wasn't planning on it. Oh, you okay? Good. Thank yeah. you so much. And again, I'm Dr. Maria Solindro. Uh, I'm practicing integrative anti-aging medicine in Pasadena, California. And this is Dr. Uh, Daryl Solindro practicing interventional pain management uh, in Londale, Los Angeles. And please don't forget to give a uh, thumbs up for this video and share with your friends. Thank you so much. And till we meet again next week, we always come in a live YouTube every Thursday at five o'clock. And we are also a um, uh, presence in Instagram and Facebook. That's the social media. Thank you, Dr. Darrell. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay, Daryl, we are done. Okay.